What is going on, you guys? Demon Phantom here, back in another video coming in tonight, guys. We're going to be taking a look at the White House today. So... Hold on, you guys. Testing. We are going to be taking a look today at the White House. So let's get started. Oh yes, here we go. Oops, hold on. You guys will not be able to hear it. Give me a second. Just inside the north entrance of the White House, this is the Cross Hall. Thousands of tourists walk here every week, taking selfies with portraits of presidents past in the same hall where Jefferson displayed antlers and pelts from Lewis and Clark's expedition. We've welcomed many heads of state here. This is the carpet that I walk down toward the East Room over there on the left to tell the world that we have delivered justice to Osama bin Laden. I'll never forget coming in here for the first time after my inauguration starting a new job and moving our family into a new home on the same day. You couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder and gratitude about this place, and that never goes away. The White House is the people's house, and Michelle and I always joke, we're just renters here, and uh, the owners are the American people and all those who invested in creating this amazing place with so much history. And what we wanted to do was to make sure that everybody felt they had access to it, that uh, it, it wasn't just the well-connected or somebody who knew a member of Congress that they could see this, that uh, as many people as possible could come in and appreciate uh, the place where a Lincoln FDR decisions that have helped uh, to shape America. And there are a lot of artifacts here that help uh, you appreciate, you know, in a, in a vivid and uh, visceral way. Uh, the 
power of, uh, of this place. Next door to the Oval Office is the Cabinet Room, with the Rose Garden just beyond those windows. The President sits at the center of the table, opposite the Vice President, and each Cabinet Secretary's seat is assigned according to when their department was established. Sitting in this room gives you the most diverse snapshot of the threats and issues the President confronts on a daily basis. It's always humbling to look around this table and see people from all walks of life, experts in agriculture and healthcare and foreign policy, working as a team in common cause. This is also where I met with congressional leaders early in 2009 as we planned America's response to the deep economic crisis we inherited at the start of my presidency. It's where President Kennedy convened his national security advisors during the 13 harrowing days of the Cuban Missile Crisis and met with NASA to plan the mission to the moon. And it's where Harry Truman took the oath of office in 1945 after Franklin Roosevelt, our longest serving president, died. I found a portrait of Truman on the wall to the right just by the entrance. Downstairs, in the basement of the West Wing, is the Situation Room. It's actually a series of rooms with secure video conference technology that lets us communicate with generals and leaders from around the globe. Intelligence and national security officials work here 24-7. Early in his presidency, John F. Kennedy recognized that the White House needed a central information center to monitor intelligence and military missions. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, used these rooms during the Vietnam War, as did George H.W. Bush during the first Gulf War, and George W. Bush after 9-11. You might know the Situation Room best as the place where we planned the raid on bin Laden watched it unfold. I'll never forget the tension of those critical hours. Back upstairs, the Roosevelt Room is the original location of the President's office in the West Wing. When Teddy Roosevelt had the West Wing built in 1902, this is where he worked. Franklin Roosevelt expanded the West Wing, including moving the Oval Office to its current location. But it was in this room that he crafted the bold proposals that became the new this is the room where my staff and I watched Congress pass the Affordable Care Act, where I've convened community leaders and business leaders and listened to their ideas about our economy, epidemics like gun violence, and great challenges like our changing climate. When you're dealing with the toughest issues of our time, it's inspiring to sit in a room named for the Roosevelt's, not only because of Teddy and Frank, but to your left, you'll see a bust of former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt next to the lamp. There's no question that Joe Biden will go down as the finest vice president in American history. This is his office, just down the hall. Joe has been my point man on implementing the economic recovery plan that saved our country from another depression, and a trusted advisor on a range of high-stakes foreign policy initiatives. A major part of his legacy will be the work we've started on the cancer moonshot, right close to Joe's big heart. As you look around this room, you can see why America loves Joe Biden. He is truly a family man. His office is overflowing with pictures of his kids and grandkids. Joe and Joe Biden have meant so much to our country over their decades of service, and to uh, Michelle and me over the past eight years. They've become like family. This is the place where I've spent a lot of time over the last eight years. I remember when I first walked in, and I looked around and I thought, uh, it's actually not as big as I <laughs> imagined on television. It's a fairly intimate space. What also struck me was the amazing light that comes in from these windows uh, that you don't always fully appreciate uh, when you just see photographs. You never stop feeling humbled by the Oval Office. You never forget that it's in this room where decisions of war and peace, and major advancements in civil rights and human rights have all been made, where for generations, major debates of the day have taken place. I meet with my senior staff here every single day. I've met here with leaders of Congress and of other countries. I always believed it was more important to take the long view and not to get sidetracked by minute-by-minute minute distractions, to stay true to my values and remember why we came here. That's why when I'm sitting at the Resolute desk, I look at busts of Lincoln and Dr. King. When I look out the window, I can also see my girl's swing set. The 
the first day coming into this house was a whirlwind because it's inauguration day. You don't get access to this house until the day that the president-elect takes the oath of office and actually becomes the president of the United States. And you feel that way for several months. Um, it takes some time to really settle in and feel like this place is your home. So it was probably around March that I started to be able to take a deep breath and feel this place as not a museum, but as my home. And once we sort of um, transcended that hurdle, um, it really does feel like home to us. Uh, there are two floors upstairs uh, above the state floors, and that's where our home is. That's where our children have grown up. Um, our children were very little, and Sasha was only in second grade, so this is really the only home she really knows. The staff here, there are friends, there are family, you know, people dearly uh, and they've done just an excellent job making this uh, wonderful house that is the people's house feel like the home for every first family that walks through those doors and we will miss it. We'll continue our visit on the state floor. Alright guys I'm gonna end the video here today for today you guys I got stuff I need to do. Thank you guys again for watching. Have a great day. social gatherings, and even family musical recitals during the Lincoln administration. Most recently, Eleanor Roosevelt organized briefings here for women journalists who were excluded from...